welcome everyone. We're so excited that you've joined us here at Christian Care Communities. Those of you who are upstairs viewing us and those of you who've tuned in through the First United Methodist Church of Fort Worth downtown from their website or you are accessing us through our YouTube channel for Dementia Friendly Fort Worth. However you found us and came across us, we are so honored that you are with us today. We have just come out of our Lenten season celebrating Easter the last time that we met and now we are on the church calendar in this whole season of Easter and it will go until it's time to celebrate Pentecost which is 50 days and then we'll be in a new season. So if you would please join me in prayer, let's go to the Lord. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you Lord for all that we experienced last week as we looked at the passion of your son Jesus Christ on our behalf and we thank you Lord that we can celebrate your renewal. We thank you for the beauty all around us with the change of seasons and we thank you Lord that we've had time to contemplate the cross, we've had time to contemplate the empty tomb and to give you ourselves anew. We ask you that you would continue by the power of your Holy Spirit to renew us to make us more and more like our beloved Savior. As we surrender more parts of our lives to you all the time, take us, Lord, use us for your glory and to build your kingdom. Thank you for bringing us together today. We honor your name. We lift it up in praise for your sake, for the name of Jesus. Thank you. <clears throat> in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As is our custom, we invite you to sing Amazing Grace. Oh, I've skipped something. I need to ask you to join me in reading or reciting the Lord's Prayer, the model prayer that Jesus gave his disciples to pray. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. One more time, this time the first verse, and then we will add the final verse. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but disciples, the prayer that he gave us to pray when we seek the face of our Heavenly Father, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. First Peter 1, 7 through 11 reads, Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Discipline yourselves and keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour. Resist him, steadfast in your faith, for you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. And after you have suffered for a little while, 
the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Let's sing our next hymn called Leave It There. into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. In this verse, Jesus is telling us not to be overly anxious about material things. And he says, if God will take care of the birds, certainly he will take care of you too. We can look at the birds in the air, as well as the flowers in the field, and we can observe God's care over creation. Matthew 10, 29 through 31 says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the very hairs on your head are all counted. So do not be afraid, for you are of more value than many sparrows. God is even more faithful to provide for us than he is to provide for those birds and these beautiful plants and flowers that we see all around us in the spring. So what is it that you're carrying today? What has you burdened? What has you worried? Just give it over to the Lord. He says, cast all of your cares on him, for he cares for you. He doesn't want you to carry it. It's a load that's not meant for you. It's meant for your Lord. So give it to him today. Our song talks about that about the birds and let's remember his word that reminds us that he feeds the birds and he will take care of all of our needs let's sing it once again if the world from you would hold of its silver and its gold and you have to get along with me verses 14 through 16 is a familiar passage telling us it says you are the light of the world a city built on a hill cannot be hidden no one after lighting a lamp puts it under a bushel basket but rather on the lampstand and it gives light to all in the house in the same way let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Let's sing Bright in the Corner together now. Do not wait until the deeds of greatness you may do. Do not wait to shed your light afar. To the many duties ever near you now be true. Bright in the corner. Across the wall, right in the corner. 
verse that we sang, someone far from harbor you may guide across the bar. Another type of light is a light from the lighthouse, guiding the ships into safe harbor. And that's what we are doing by announcing the gospel, where people can come in and be saved and find Jesus as their Savior and their refuge. Uh, the other verses talk about, Just as above are clouded with skies that you may help to clear, let not narrow self your way debar. Though into one heart alone may fall your song of cheer, brighten the corner where you are. Here for all your talent, you may surely find a need. Here reflect the bright and morning star. Even from your humble hand, the bread of life may feed. Brighten the corner where you are. All the Lord needs is a willing heart, and he does the best. We give him ourselves fully. We give him our talents. We give him our time. We give him our treasures, and we say, here I am, Lord, use me. And we shine our light. Let's sing it through once again. Do not wait until the day of greatness to wait. Do not wait to shed your light afar. To the many duties ever near you now be true. Brighten the corner where you are. Brighten the corner where you are. Brighten the corner. about when the Lord allowed the Israelites to return to their land from the Babylonian captivity and they were able to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild their precious temple. <clears throat> Psalm 126 reads, When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, and Zion is or the Jewish people, the state of Israel, we were like those who dream then our mouths were filled with laughter and our tongues with shouts of joy. And then it was said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we rejoiced. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the watercourses in the Negev. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping, bearing seed for the sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy carrying their sheaves. The next song we're going to sing is Bringing in the Sheaves. Sowing in the morning, sowing seeds of kindness, sowing in the noontide and the dewy, waiting for the harvest and the time of reaping, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. For in due season we shall reap a harvest if we do not lose heart. So let's keep on working wherever we are. Maybe the Lord has you as a prayer warrior for your family members. Maybe you're not able to get out and about as often, but you have a calling. You have a purpose. So let's continue to sow the seed, whether it be through word or deed, to other people and we will reap the harvest if we do not lose heart. Let's sing it once again. Sowing in the morning, sowing seeds of kindness, sowing in the noontide and the dewy eve, waiting for the harvest and the time of reaping, we shall not rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves.
Jesus' name is a well-known hymn. It's a declaration of praise, but it's also much more than that. The words both declare the majesty of Christ and tax us with making that majesty known to all. Like many hymns describing the glory of God and the hope that one day all people will see that glory, this hymn alludes to Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, which says, At the name of Jesus, every, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We long for this day and declare our hope in its arrival in the text of this hymn. But are we willing to declare that hope to those who have not heard it? <clears throat> Let's go ahead and think about that while we sing All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. King. And what do we need to think about? So the fourth stanza of this great hymn declares, we'll join the everlasting song. Everlasting. No beginning, no end. Everlasting. So that means that angels and men, women, down through the ages have proclaimed Jesus as Lord, and we are now a part of that song in our lifetimes. Are we willing to lift our voices together to do more than merely sing a hymn, but to speak out for him, for his glory? And that's the way that we can truly crown our God, Lord of all. Let's sing it again. All hail the power of Jesus, name, and angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the and obey. This hymn paints a picture of communion with God in which, fear, <coughs> in which fear and gloom have disappeared and delight and joy saturate one's existence. However, this attractive life is not free. The Christian must totally surrender control of his life to God and commit to trusting obedience of God's wishes. As the final stanza says, what he says we will do and where he sins, we will go. Let's sing Trust and Obey, the first verse, and then I'll tell you the story. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, our glory sheds on our way. There's still his good will, he abides with us still, and we all who inspired by a story 
from one, one of Dwight L. Moody's evangelistic meetings held in Brockton, Massachusetts in the mid-1880s. Daniel B. Towner heard a young man say in his testimony, I'm not quite sure, but I'm going to trust and I'm going to obey. So Towner wrote down that sentence. And he sent it with the story about the young man to a Presbyterian minister named John H. Samus, who wrote the refrain and then the stanzas of this hymn, and it became published in 1887. This hymn is known either by its first line, when we walk with the Lord, or by the phrase that ends every stanza and begins and ends the refrain, trust and obey. The first stanza speaks of the blessedness of following God. In the second stanza, it talks about not a shadow, uh, not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he does richly repay. Not a grief or a loss, not a frown or a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. Uh, I think maybe our stanzas are, are a little different than what I wrote from what I learned about this hymn. But there is a stanza that says, not a shadow, and it's assuring us that we can bear any sorrow when we look to his face and observe that he is smiling on us. Because if you're his child, he's smiling on you. He approves of your life. He likes watching your life unfold, and he likes bringing you good things. The third stanza talks about not a burden, and it assures us that God will give us the strength to deal with any troubles that life can bring. While the fourth stanza that says we can never prove warns us that total surrender is required in order to share God's promised blessings. And the final stanza says then in fellowship sweet it paints a picture of blissful communion with god as we live out a life of trusting obedience once more let's sing trust and obey when we walk with the lord to sing this hymn about the wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Sing them over again. Here we go. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and to make a living by working on farms and lumber camps, all the while trying to continue his schooling. He was converted at a revival meeting at age 12. Bliss became an itinerant music teacher, making house calls on horseback during the winter and during the summer attending the Normal Academy of Music in Genesco, New York. His first song was published in 1864 and in 1868, Dwight L. Moody advised him to become a singing evangelist. For the last two years of his life, Bliss traveled with Major D. W. Whittle and led the music at the revival meetings in the Midwest and the Southern United States. 
Bliss's tragic death at only the age of 38 happened near the end of 1876. Philip Bliss and his wife were traveling to Chicago to sing for the evangelistic services <coughs> led by Daniel W. Whittle at Dwight L. Moody's Tabernacle, but a train wreck and fire en route claimed their lives. He lost his arm in the train wreck and he never recovered. An infection set in and he passed away. But he wrote this glorious hymn helping us to focus on the wonderful words of Jesus and of the, the Bible, the Word of God. Let's sing it again. Now therefore revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. Now if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served in the, in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me... Me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then he said to them all, this is Luke 9, 23 through 26. Then he said to them all, and this is a, these are some of the hard words of Jesus. He said, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit them if they gain the whole world, but lose or forfeit their own soul for themselves? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words, of them the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. 1 Timothy 6, 12 through 14, fight the good fight of faith, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and for which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep the commandment without spot or blame until the manifestation of our Lord Jesus. This hymn gives us courage, it gives us a charge to stand up for Jesus. Let's sing it through together. to write this text after hearing the dying words of a Presbyterian colleague named Dudley A. Tyne, or Ting, ousted from his own congregation for his strong anti-slavery stance, Tyne preached to large crowds in weekday meetings sponsored by the YMCA. His work spearheaded an, evangel in, 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 an evangelical revival in Philadelphia early in 1858. And on Tying or Ting's deathbed, caused by a farm accident, 
Duffield and others asked him, do you have any final message? And Tyne replied, tell them to stand up for Jesus. At Tyne's memorial service on April the 25th, 1858, Duffield preached on Ephesians 6:14 and concluded his sermon by reading his new hymn text, stand up, stand up for Jesus. So that's what we're charged to do, take a stand to represent Jesus in all we think, say, and do, and have our words point people to him because he's worth it. Let's sing it again. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer. This hymn was written by Frederick William Faber, or Faber, who was raised in an Anglican parsonage in Yorkshire, England. He attended Oxford University and was greatly influenced by the great Roman Catholic John Henry Newman, the author of the hymn Lead Kindly Light. After his graduation from Oxford, Frederick entered the Anglican priesthood. But he was a troubled soul, drawn to the historic liturgy of the Catholic Church, so on November 16, 1845, he announced to his congregation that he intended to leave the Church of England to be ordained as a Roman Catholic. He began writing hymns for English Catholics to sing, the most famous of which is Faith of Our Fathers. What most of us Protestants don't know about this hymn is that he wrote this song to remind the Catholic Church of its martyrs during the reign of Protestant King Henry VIII and Queen Elizabeth I, because during their reign they persecuted and killed those who said the Mass or honored the Pope or harbored a priest. So he wanted to remind them of their faith of their forefathers those who gave their lives in the Catholic Church. Interesting, right? We would have no idea, we wouldn't know that. So the verses say, faith of our fathers living still in spite of dungeon, fire, and sword. Oh, how our hearts beat high with joy whenever we hear that glorious word. The second verse says, faith of our fathers, we will strive to win all nations unto thee. And through the truth that comes from God, mankind shall then be truly free. The verse 3, faith of our fathers, we will love both friend and foe in all our strife, and preach thee, too, as love knows how, by kindly words and virtuous life. So it's reminding them of the sacrifices of their forefathers, and then wanting to, I guess you could say, carry on the torch. We've had a lot of allusions to light today. So let's sing it once again, Faith of Our Father. Or have, we haven't sung it yet, right? Faith of Our Father's not the popular opinion or view? Can you risk your reputation because you love him that much and you count him as that worthy? Be thinking about that. How can you stand on the faith that has been passed down to you and continue to pass it down to others? Let's sing it again.
verses 2 through 6, we read, Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid, for the Lord God is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the nations, proclaim that his name is exalted, sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be known in all the earth. Shout aloud and sing for joy, O royal Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Let's sing, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. with relationships with people. Jesus said, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. He also said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give it to you. Let your hearts not be troubled, neither let them be afraid. In 1880, the husband of Louisa Stead, author of Tis So Street to Trust in Jesus, drowned. Her husband drowned. Two years later, this hymn was published. It is widely believed that she wrote this hymn in response to the peace she found in trusting Jesus despite her sorrow. Mrs. Stead went on to serve for many years as a missionary in Africa. So let's again sing the first verse of Tiso Street, Sweet to Trust in Jesus, once again. Thank mm-hmm. you. 